seven prophecies yet to be fulfilled. Number one, the rapture. When the Lord comes back and descends from heaven, his appearance will be visible to the whole world, as will the rise of his people to meet him in the air, an event known as the rapture. Some have erroneously taught about a secret rapture. However, this event will be far from secret. In fact, it will be one of the most public events in human history, as evidenced by Jesus' description. And he will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest end of the earth and heaven. Matthew chapter 24, verse 31. This is not a secret. First Thessalonians chapter 4 gives a comprehensive description of what will happen at that point. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then, we will be with the Lord forever. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. In the Greek language, there exist two distinct words for air. One of the words is aether, which was later adapted into the English language as ether. The other word is air, which was used to refer to the lower air, which is adjacent to the earth's surface. This is the term that is being referred to in the text above. When the time comes for us to meet Jesus, he will be in close proximity to the earth. It's hard to imagine anyone being unaware of the momentous occasion when the Lord is shouting, the archangel is speaking, and God's trumpet is sounding. It will be a truly unforgettable experience. Some people say that the word rapture is not contained in the New Testament. While this statement is true, it largely depends on the translation being used. Since the New Testament was not originally written in English, the interpretation of certain words and phrases can vary. For instance, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, the phrase, caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air, could be translated in different ways, leading to a difference in interpretation. What about this word, rapture? It is a fascinating, gripping word. In the Greek language, it is known as harpazo. This word is used in several passages of the New Testament to describe the rapture. In John 10, the word is used three times to illustrate how a wolf snatches a sheep from the fold. This action is violent and abrupt. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. John chapter 10, verse 12. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 4 and 19, the phrase, caught away, is used to describe the action of a bird swooping down, picking up a seed, and flying away. In the New Testament, this phrase is used multiple times to describe people being taken up from the earth. For example, after Philip baptized the eunuch in Acts 8, he was caught away, he was raptured. Acts chapter 8, verse 39, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Paul speaks of a friend of his, mentioned twice in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, who was caught up to the third heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 4. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. And Revelation chapter 12 verse 5 says, She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. 
Four times in other passages, the same word is used of taking somebody by force from a crowd or from some situation. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. John chapter 6, verse 15. Acts chapter 23, verse 10. And Jude chapter 23. So here is a list of the features that the rapture implies. It will happen without warning. It will be sudden and forceful. There will be no time to be getting ready. If we are not prepared, we will miss the rapture, which will happen suddenly according to Matthew chapter 24. At that time, two men will be in the field. One will be taken for judgment, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken for judgment, and one will be left. Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 through 41. The Gospel of Luke says there will be two in one bed. One will be taken the other left, Luke chapter 17, verse 34. So there is a sudden dramatic eternal separation of people closest to each other, two women working in the mill, the two men working in the field, even the two who share the same bed. When the rapture comes, it snatches one and leaves the other. It's crucial to decide whether we'll be taken or left behind. So be alert, give strict attention, be cautious and active in faith. For you do not know which day, whether near or far, your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the head of the house had known what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you who follow me must also be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 through 44. If the master had known what was going to happen, he would have stayed awake and been watchful, Jesus said. He advised his disciples to always be ready, as we can never be certain when he will return. Jesus cautioned against presumption, noting that those who think they know the time of his return are mistaken. I emphasize this because millions of Christians have fallen for revelations that Jesus came on a certain day or at a certain time. It is totally contrary to his teaching. We noted earlier these words from Mark chapter 13. Therefore, be continually on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning. Stay alert, in case he should come suddenly and unexpectedly, and find you asleep and unprepared. What I say to you, I say to everyone, be on the alert, stay awake, and be continually cautious. Mark chapter 13, verses 35 through 37. We need to be alert and vigilant. This does not imply that we should deprive ourselves of sleep. It means that we should be perceptive of the signs around us. Many people are aware of the four seasons, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, but not everyone is familiar with them. As we gaze up towards the tall trees, we see their bare branches reaching towards the sky. Soon after, transformation takes place. Small green buds start to emerge, spreading a green haze and indicating the arrival of summer. In Luke's record of this discourse, Jesus says to look at the fig tree and all the trees. Luke chapter 21, verse 29. Jesus is telling us, in effect, when we see the trees putting on their leaves, we do not need to go to the public library to find out what is happening next. Summer is next. And when we see that this is happening in the world, we do not have to go to the church to ask the pastor. We can see for ourselves that a change is occurring. As we gaze up at the trees, we can sense and comprehend the truth. It is crucial for us to remain vigilant and not fall into a deep, animalistic slumber. In the days leading up to the end, we will witness several remarkable and stunning signs in the heavens. These signs will indicate that the arrival of the Lord is imminent. There will be Jesus' glory, the Father's glory, and the glory of the angels. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 23 says that the sun and moon will be embarrassed because their light will be so dim and ineffective by comparison. This appeals to me. I can just imagine it. And furthermore, that light, though so brilliant, will not hurt our eyes. I am looking forward to that. It is something worth waiting for, worth enduring for. If we lose sight of it, we are going to get despondent because things are going to get worse. Remember, the 
birth pangs are not going to diminish. They're going to increase. When the Lord comes back, descending from heaven, His appearance will be visible to the whole world, as will the rising up of His people to meet Him in the air, an event known as the rapture. The rapture is perhaps the most important prophecy for us to understand because it may have a personal impact on us. The upcoming event marks the first part of Christ's two-part return to earth. First, remove the church from the world. Second, seven years later, he'll establish his kingdom on earth. There are eight prophecies in the Bible about Christ's second coming for every one about his first. The New Testament's 260 chapters contain 318 references to Christ's second coming. God's people from all ages, the disciples, the martyrs of the ages, your godly ancestors, and many more, will rise from their graves at the rapture. Each of the three major passages teaching about the rapture indicates that it is only for believers, including innocent children too young to believe. Anyone who does not believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior will not be raptured into the Lord's presence. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus spoke to his disciples, who were clearly believers. He assured them that he would prepare a place for them in his Father's house. They, like Christians now, were members of the family of faith. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Do not let your heart be troubled, afraid, cowardly. Believe confidently in God and trust in Him. Have faith, hold on to it, rely on it, keep going and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. I will come again and receive you to myself, describes what we call the rapture, the uniting of Jesus Christ with his faithful followers. The rapture is restricted to believers. Only those who are followers of Christ will be taken up into heaven when he returns. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 57. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The rapture has the power to transform our lives. It is a source of personal comfort and hope. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians about it to ease their grief over their loved ones who had died. Death is not the end. Death's effects will be reversed by the resurrection of believers who have died. Everyone who has lost a loved one to the sting of death can find solace in the knowledge that they will see them again. It is, however, a source of strength. On the night he was arrested, Jesus promised his disciples that he would return for them. Number two, the revelation of the final Antichrist. How can we identify the Antichrist? According to the Bible during the tribulation, a man known as the Antichrist will emerge with the aim of uniting the world under one authority. This tyrant, likened to his father, the devil, will initially appear as an angel of light, but will eventually reveal his true evil nature through his actions. Here are six answers to questions about this future sign of the apocalypse. Who is the Antichrist? The Antichrist is someone who opposes Christ. Anti can also mean instead of, and both meanings apply to this coming world leader. At the same time, he will openly oppose Christ. The Antichrist will do all in his power to live up to his dreadful moniker. As Satan leads the world's forces into the battle of Armageddon, he will persecute, torture, and kill God's people. He will become the most tyrannical leader in history, surpassing even Caesar. 
Although the Bible only mentions the Antichrist by name four times, he is referred to many more times under various identities such as the beast, the little horn, and the man of lawlessness, the one who brings destruction. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, and the lawless one. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring him to an end by the appearance of his coming. When he comes on the scene, people will flock to him like flies to honey and they will do anything he asks. How will he unite the nations? The prophet Daniel describes the Antichrist as a fourth beast with eyes like a man's and a mouth uttering arrogant words. He will speak against the Most High in a pompous manner. This description is from a vision that Daniel saw during the night. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. He will speak words against the Most High, God, and wear down the saints of the Most High. And he will intend to change the times and the law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, two times, and a half time, three and one half years. As Daniel predicts, the next world leader will be known for his or her eloquence, which will attract the world's attention and administration. Daniel predicts that the orator will speak in high-flown terms and blasphemy against God. The apostle John agrees in Revelation. And the beast was given a mouth, the power of speech, uttering great things and arrogant and blasphemous words. And he was given freedom and authority to act and to do as he pleased for 42 months, three and a half years. Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. The Antichrist is described as a man whose appearance was greater than his brothers. Daniel chapter 7, verse 20. And the meaning of the ten horns, kings, that were on its head and the other horn, which came up later, and before which three of the horns fell, specifically that horn which had eyes and a mouth that boasted great things and which looked larger than the others. He will be extremely irresistible to the masses due to his charismatic personality, speaking abilities, and outstanding good looks. The Apostle John adds to Daniel's account of the Antichrist's blasphemous activities by stating that everyone alive will be required to worship him and he is given power to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast will even appear to speak and cause those who do not bow down and worship the image of the beast to be put to death. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. The Antichrist is described as a beast in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, which is a fitting portrayal. In the last three and a half years of the tribulation, the Antichrist will embody Satan himself. According to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. The Antichrist will move from being a regional leader to a global tyrant, cruelly ruling over the world and finally claiming to be a god. Revelation chapter 13, and the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of his heads, which seemed to have a fatal wound, but his fatal wound was healed, and the entire earth followed after the beast in amazement. They fell down and worshipped the dragon, because he gave his authority to the beast. They also worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like as great as the beast, and who is able to wage war against him? How does the Antichrist gain political power? His rise to power will be subtle and unnoticed at first, even to those closest to him. He will emerge from the common people. And the dragon, Satan, stood on the sandy shore of the sea. Then I saw a vicious beast coming up out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten royal crowns, diadems. And on his heads were blasphemous names. Revelation chapter 13 verse 1. The sea in biblical imagery stands for the general mass of humanity, or more specifically, the Gentile nations. The tribulation, as terrible as it will be, will always be under God's control. Satan is limited by a leash held by God. Who will worship the Antichrist? According to Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. According to Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, the Antichrist is a cult leader. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. 
he will try to exalt himself to God's level and speak from there. Number three, the revelation of the two witnesses. The two witnesses, a portrayal of two people who will aid in carrying out the work that God has for them to do during the time of the tribulation, can be found in Revelation chapter 11. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will be clothed in burlap, and will prophesy during those 1,260 days. These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 through 5. At the beginning of the church age, John on Patmos is the prophet. At the end, there will be two witnesses who will prophesy in the city of Jerusalem. There is a sense of impending disaster in the spectacular appearance of these two. The verse reads, My two witnesses. The nature of their ministry is prophetic, as evidenced by the fact that they will prophesy, they preach and display repentance, as seen by their wearing sackcloth, and they have an effective ministry as we read, I will give power. The two witnesses indeed served with power. Such power, in fact, that they can witness for 1,260 days, despite the world's antagonism. We also read, And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. God has given the two witnesses special protection, similar to Elijah. The two witnesses in the book of Revelation will have miraculous powers to accompany their message, and no one will be able to stop them in their work. Revelation chapter 11, verse 6. They have power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have the power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. The two witnesses will have miraculous power, but they will be killed when their testimony is concluded. The wicked world will rejoice, allowing the bodies of the fallen prophets to lie in the streets. Revelation chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. When they complete their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them, and he will conquer them and kill them. And their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem, the city that is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, the city where the Lord was crucified. And for three and a half days, all peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies. No one will be allowed to bury them. All the people who belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who had tormented them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. The term as Sodom speaks of immorality, and the term as Egypt speaks of oppression and slavery. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another. The earth saw and triumphed over the deaths of the two witnesses. Their bodies will lie in the streets for just over three days, while the transnational mass, tormented in conscience by their expressions, gloat over and celebrate their removal. When the two are resurrected in full view of everyone, the relief will turn to terror. Their ascension will be triggered by a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. The reviving of the two witnesses. Revelation chapter 11, verses 11 through 12. But after three and a half days, God breathed life into them, and they stood up. Terror struck all who were staring at them. Then a loud voice from heaven called to the two prophets, Come up here. And they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched. Because the earth was unworthy of these two witnesses, God simply summoned them, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud. We read the phrase, come up here. The earth was not worthy of these two witnesses, so God simply called them home, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud. It is clear that the masses always fail to listen to the prophets of God. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake. An earthquake brings judgment and inspires many to praise God, but it remains to be seen whether this will result in genuine repentance leading to salvation. There are three primary theories on the identity of the two witnesses in Revelation. Number one, Moses and Elijah. 
Moses witnessed more miracles than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob combined, with several miracles occurring one after another as God interceded on behalf of his people. The witnesses will have the power to convert water into blood, replicating one of Moses' most famous miracles. Also, giving strength to this view is that Moses and Elijah both appeared with Jesus at the Transfiguration. Revelation chapter 11, verse 5. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. Some believe Elijah is one of the witnesses because his ministry appears similar to these two witnesses. James chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. In addition, Jewish tradition anticipates the return of Moses and Elijah. This is based on the prediction of Elijah's coming in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, as well as God's promise to raise a prophet like Moses, which some Jews think requires Moses' return. Number 2. Enoch and Elijah because of the extraordinary events surrounding each of their deaths, Enoch and Elijah are often considered potential candidates for the roles of the two witnesses. From what we understand, God has only ever brought two people directly to heaven without their first having to go through the process of dying. The passage in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, which states that it is destined for all men to die once, is cited by supporters of this perspective. It would appear that the fact that Enoch and Elijah have not yet been put to death qualifies them for the role of the two witnesses, who will both be put to death once they have completed their respective tasks. Since neither Enoch nor Elijah died a natural death, but were instead carried to heaven, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 states that it is appointed for men to die once. Some people believe that the two witnesses must be Enoch and Elijah. They reason that since it is set for men to die once, Enoch and Elijah must return to the earth to die there. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Number 3. They are unknown. It is entirely within God's ability to take two believers considered ordinary and empower them to accomplish the same signs and wonders as Moses and Elijah did. There is nothing in Revelation 11 that compels us to assume a famous identity for the two witnesses. There is an intriguing chapter located in Zechariah 4 that provides us with a model for the two witnesses that are mentioned in Revelation. In a vision that Zechariah gets, he sees a lampstand made entirely of solid gold. So, who are the two Revelation witnesses? The Bible is silent on the subject. All three of the above interpretations are valid and plausible for Christians, and Christians should not be dogmatic about the identity of the two witnesses. We don't know who these two witnesses are, and all attempts to identify them are pure conjecture. We must wait and see who they are, but it does not matter. What they do and what is done to them are important things. Before leaving this section, two anticipations need to be noted. Number four the three worst judgments in the book of Revelation. The seven seals, the seven bowls, the seven trumpets. The three worst judgments in the book of Revelation. Number one, seals, the seven seals. Revelation chapter six through 16 covers Satan on earth. The seven seals are part of God's end of the world judgments. Revelation chapter six verses one through 17 details the seals. The action begins in chapter 5 of Revelation, with the search for someone in heaven and on earth, someone worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. The seven seals in heaven, according to John's vision, holds a scroll, and as each seal is broken, a new judgment is unleashed on the world. John writes, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. The scroll includes God's judgments. No one was judged worthy of breaching the seals and unlocking the scroll, which saddens John. If the scroll could not be opened, evil would not be judged, and evil would continue to plague the earth. 
While John is sobbing over the unopened scroll and its seven intact seals, he receives excellent news. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. This is a representation of Jesus Christ, the slain lamb who is also the Lion of Judgment. As Jesus takes the scroll to open the seals and deliver judgment on the unbelieving world, the beings in heaven glorify him with a new song. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song with these words, You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. John chapter 5, verse 22. In addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge. The Lamb begins to open the seals in the midst of the worship due to him. The scroll can be unrolled a little further with each seal opened, exposing the judgments God has in store for the tribulation time little by bit. The first four of the seven seals open, releasing what are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse because the judgments appear metaphorically as a horse and rider leaving destruction in their path. The first seal, Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 through 2. As I watched, the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll. Then I heard one of the four living beings say with a voice like thunder, Come. I looked up and saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow, and a crown was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. The second seal. Great battle erupts on the world when the Lamb releases the second seal. This is represented by a rider on a blazing red horse wielding a huge sword. Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. When the Lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living being say, Come. Then another horse appeared, a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and the authority to take peace from the earth. And there was war and slaughter everywhere. The second seal's fiery red horse represents chaos. Following the initial period of peace that precedes the tribulation, the world will devolve into violence with people attempting to destroy one another. The third seal. Famine results from the breakdown of the third of the seven seals. Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. When the Lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, Come. I looked up and saw a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings say, a loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay, and don't waste the olive oil and wine. The fourth seal. When the fourth seal is broken, John sees a pale horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed close behind him. As a result of the fourth seal, one-fourth of the world's population is slain by sword, famine, and pestilence, as well as by the wild beasts of the earth. Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 through 8. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living being say, Come. I looked up and saw a horse whose color was pale green. Its rider was named Death, and his companion was the grave. These two were given authority over one-fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword in famine and disease and wild animals. The fifth seal. The fifth seal of the scroll indicates those who would be martyred throughout the tribulation for their trust in Christ. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus, who were to be martyred, had joined them. The Sixth Seal When the Lamb of God breaks the Sixth Seal, a great earthquake strikes, inflicting massive destruction and extraordinary astronomical phenomena. The sun goes black, the moon changes blood red, and the heavens recede like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was displaced from its place. Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. 
Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs, falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all of the mountains and islands were moved from their place. Survivors of the sixth seal, regardless of their social status, seek shelter in caverns and cry out to the mountains and rocks for help. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who can stand? An intermission in the book of Revelation follows the opening of the six of the seven seals. The seventh seal. Revelation chapter 8 verse 1. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. The judgments that led up to the end of the tribulation are now evident in the scroll, and they are so harsh that all of heaven falls silent. The seventh seal clearly heralds the start of the next round of judgments, as John instantly sees seven angels holding seven trumpets ready to blow. An eighth angel takes a censer and burns much incense in it, indicating God's people's petitions. Revelation chapter 8, verse 5. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth. And thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. When the seven sealed judgments are completed, the second phase of the tribulation, which includes the seven trumpet judgments, will begin. Number two, the seven trumpets. In Revelation chapters eight through nine, John describes a time near the end of the world when angels sound seven trumpets. Each trumpet heralds the arrival of a new round of judgment on the people of the earth. The seven trumpets are described in Revelation chapter 8 and 9, as well as in Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. The trumpets represent disasters. The judgments heralded by the seven trumpets will occur during the tribulation period at the end of the world. Seven angels who stand in God's presence are given seven trumpets, which will be used to unleash another round of judgments. The first trumpet, Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. The first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire, one third of the trees were burned, and all the green grass was burned. This plague destroys one third of the world's trees and consumes all grass. This judgment bears some resemblance to Egypt's seventh plague. The second trumpet, Revelation chapter eight, verses eight through nine. Then the second angel blew his trumpet and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One third of the water in the sea became blood. One third of all things living in the sea died. and One third of all the ships on the sea were destroyed. In heaven, a second angel sounds a trumpet the result is that something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turns to blood, a third of the ships sink, and a third of ocean life dies. Verse 9. This judgment is similar in some ways to the first plague in Egypt. The third trumpet. Revelation chapter 8, verses 10 through 11. Then the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch, it fell on one-third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was bitterness. It made one-third of the water bitter. Many people died from drinking the bitter water. The third trumpet judgment is like the second, except it affects the world's freshwater lakes and rivers instead of the oceans. Specifically, a great star, blazing like a torch, falls from the sky and poisons a third of the water supply. Revelation chapter 8, verse 10. The fourth trumpet. Revelation chapter 8, verses 12 through 13. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and one third of the sun was struck, and one third of the moon, and the one third of the stars, and they became dark. And one third of the day was dark, and also one third of the night. Then I looked, and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air, terror, 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 to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. Following the fourth trumpet judgment, John observes a special warning given by an eagle flying through the air. This eagle cries out in a loud voice, Woe! Woe! Woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. 
For this reason, the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets are referred to as the three woes. The fifth trumpet. The angel of the abyss serves as the king of these demonic locusts. Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. In Hebrew, he is known as Abaddon, and in Greek, he is known as Apollyon, which means destroyer. These beings will be given the authority to torture anyone who does not bear God's seal. The pain they cause will be so excruciating that sufferers will wish to die. Abaddon, Apollyon, is the abyss's ruler and the king of these demonic locusts. The sixth trumpet. The sixth trumpet and the second woe heralds the arrival of yet another demonic horde. When the sixth trumpet blows, a voice from God's altar requests the release of the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. These four evil angels command a supernatural cavalry of thousands upon thousands to slay one-third of humanity. The seventh trumpet. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices shouting in heaven, The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The seven trumpet judgments have come to an end. All is set for the seven angels with the seven bowls of God's wrath. These angels stand inside the now open temple, ready to step forward and bring the final judgments on earth. Revelation 15. The seven bowls of Revelation. The concept of the bowls, often referred to as the bowls of wrath or vials of wrath, is found in the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible. Basically, these bowls are like containers of God's wrath. By this time, people had done a lot of evil, especially under a leader called the Antichrist. Before the seven bowls are poured out, there are a series of other events and judgments. The first bowl. Revelation 16 begins with a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels. Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 through 2. Then I heard a mighty voice from the temple say to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out on the earth the seven bowls containing God's wrath. So the first angel left the temple and poured out his bowl on the earth, and horrible malignant sores broke out on everyone who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. The first angel, carrying his bowl, approached the earth. He emptied its contents. Immediately a terrifying change occurred. Those who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image, the very emblem of their rebellion against the Creator, were suddenly afflicted. These marks are now sores. The second bowl. Following the first bowl, which brought painful sores upon those who bore the mark of the beast, the heavens prepared for another momentous act. The angel stepped forward. In his hand, he held the bowl filled with a mysterious liquid. Revelation chapter 16, verse 3, recounts the moment. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and everything in the sea died. Blood as of a dead man. The sea doesn't necessarily become blood, but as of a corpse's blood. It will match the appearance and sickening character of the blood in a dead body. The third bowl. The rivers and springs aren't spared here either. They too turn into blood. Water, the very essence of life, is transformed into a symbol of death. Revelation chapter 16, verse 4. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they turned into blood. This complete contamination is in contrast to the partial one-third pollution of fresh waters shown in Revelation 8. The fourth bowl. It was the time for the fourth bowl. An angel stepped forward, holding the next vessel of judgment. The target of this bowl was neither the land nor the water, but the very sun that lights up the sky. Revelation chapter 16, verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was given power to scorch humanity with raging fire. All of a sudden, things started to change. The sun, which had always been a source of light, warmth, and sustenance, was given a new and terrible power. The fifth bowl. Upon the command of the heavens, the fifth angel set forth, directing his bowl not to the seas, mountains, or rivers, but straight onto the very throne of the beast, the epicenter of wickedness. Revelation chapter 16, verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. And people gnawed their tongues because of the pain 
of their excruciating anguish and severe torment. When this bowl was poured out, it made the sun disappear, turning the beast's kingdom completely dark. Think of a world with no light at all, where it's so dark you can't see anything. This darkness wasn't calm or soothing. It felt heavy and made people really uncomfortable. The profound darkness, however, was just the beginning of their torment. The sixth bowl. In his hand, the sixth angel held the bowl filled with God's judgment. It was clear that this vessel had a divine purpose, and the angel understood the gravity of its contents. The entire cosmos seemed to come to a standstill in anticipation of what was about to happen. Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the coming of the kings from the east. As the water from the big Euphrates River went down, what used to block the way now became a clear path. The Euphrates River, an extended part of the Fertile Crescent area, is a significant landmark in scripture and a valuable resource in the Middle East as it runs through Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. The seventh bowl. In the heavens, the scene was dramatic. The seventh angel, with the final bowl of God's punishment, got ready to pour it out. This wasn't just any bowl. It was like the last chapter of all the judgments that came before. It really showed how severe and final God's decision was. Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne of God, saying, It is done. It is all over. It is all accomplished. It has come. The book of Revelation talks about the world's ending and God's final plan. With each bowl poured out, the urgency and gravity of God's judgment become clearer. The purpose of the described events is not to cause fear, but rather to emphasize the significant consequences of a society that rejects its creator. The story features God's wrath. The judgments serve as a profound testament to God's righteous indignation against the wickedness and rebellion of humanity. As each bowl is poured out, the earth experiences unprecedented calamities from painful sores afflicting people, Revelation chapter 16 verse 2, to the sun scorching the earth with intense heat, Revelation chapter 16 verse 8. Number 5. Jesus meets the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon. What will happen to the Antichrist while he leads the Armageddon battle? The people will become more dissatisfied with the leadership of this global dictator who has broken every promise he has made throughout the Battle of Armageddon. Major parts of the world will begin to build their own military forces in an attempt to overthrow him. Major segments of the world will begin to assemble their own military forces and rebel against him. At the end time, the King of the South will push and attack him, the Antichrist, and the King of the North will storm against him with chariots and horsemen and with many ships, and he will enter countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. Some of the initial attempts at rebellion against the Antichrist will be crushed by the Antichrist, but something happens that prevents him from achieving his aim of destroying Israel and Jerusalem. But rumors from the east and from the north will alarm and disturb him, and he will set out with great fury to destroy and to annihilate many. Daniel chapter 11, verse 44. The Bible leaves no doubt as to the source of the news that so disturbs and enrages the Antichrist. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the coming of the kings from the east. Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. The Euphrates is one of the greatest rivers in the world. With the disappearance of the Euphrates, the Antichrist will be susceptible to attack by the rulers of the East if the Euphrates disappears. Their arrival will signal the start of the biggest battle in human history. Number six, the seal of God in the mark of the beast. What is the seal of God in the book of Revelation? In the New Testament, the term sealed is derived from a Greek word that means to stamp with a private mark. It means to keep something hidden or protect or conserve the sealed object. 
In ancient times, seals were commonly used in official contexts to ensure the authenticity of important documents. For instance, a Roman centurion would have affixed a seal to a document that was meant to be reviewed only by his superior. Breaking the seal would indicate that the document had been tampered with or read by someone other than the intended recipient. The use of seals was an effective way to maintain the confidentiality and integrity of sensitive information. We see the seal of God in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, filled with mysterious visions and messages, introduces us to the idea of God's seal in a very special and meaningful way. Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 through 2 tells us, This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, His unveiling of the divine mysteries, which God the Father gave to Him to show to His bondservants, believers, the things which must soon take place in their entirety. And He sent and communicated it by His angel, divine messenger, to His bondservant John, who testified and gave supporting evidence to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to everything that he saw in his visions. This part of the Bible starts to explain the important messages that come later, including the meaning of God's seal. The seal of God is like a special sign from God. It shows that God is protecting certain people, that they belong to him, and that they are genuine followers of his. This seal is talked about during the wild and scary events in Revelation's visions. It's important to know that this seal isn't a physical mark. It's more like a spiritual badge. It's a way to show who is really connected to God and who is under His protection. The mark of God shows up during the tribulation. The tribulation is a future seven-year period when God will finalize His judgment of the unbelieving world. Throughout the Word of God, Tribulation is associated to the day of the Lord, which refers to the period of time when God will directly intervene in the course of history to bring about the fulfillment of His plan. That day will be a day of wrath. It will be a day of agony and anguish. It will be a day of trouble and devastation. It will be a day of darkness and gloom. It will be a day of clouds and darkness. It will be a day of trumpet and battle cry. The tribulation period will be characterized by a variety of divine judgments, turmoil in the heavenly sphere, natural calamities, and horrific plagues. The 144,000 sealed servants. The 144,000 sealed servants is a mix of mystery, symbols, and promises about the end times. This talk about 144,000 of God's servants being specially chosen and marked for protection. These servants come from the 12 tribes of Israel. The act of sealing, as described in Revelation, signifies a divine mark of protection and ownership. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, it says, And I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. The sealing process is not just a literal marking, but symbolizes a spiritual preservation during times of tribulation. Each of the 12 tribes of Israel contributes 12,000 members, signifying a completeness and perfection in God's selection. The number 144,000 is rich in symbolism. In biblical numerology, 12 often represents divine authority and completeness. Multiplying 12 tribes by 12,000, members from each tribe suggests a magnified completeness. Contrast with the mark of the beast. In the book of Revelation, the seal of God and the mark of the beast are powerful marks that represent the eternal battle between good and evil and the stark contrast between God's divine authority and the world's earthly power. These symbols have captured the imagination of generations of believers and non-believers alike and continue to inspire reflection and contemplation to this day. The seal of God, the seal of God, mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 through 3, represents divine protection and ownership. It's given to God's faithful followers, marking them as His own in a spiritual sense. Unlike a physical mark, it symbolizes a deep, personal commitment to God and His teachings. Possessing the seal of God indicates a spiritual safeguarding during times of trial and judgment. It's a sign of being chosen by God, reflecting a life lived in accordance with divine principles mark of the beast. 
Mark of the Beast, talked about in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 through 17, is a sign that shows loyalty to the beast, a bad character against God. It means turning away from God and choosing to follow the power of people in the world, which is often not right or good. The Mark of the Beast appears in Revelation. The Mark of the Beast is referred to as the Mark of the Beast because it is brought into being by a man who is referred to as the Beast. According to the Bible passages in Revelation chapter 16, verse 2, and chapter 19, verse 20, the mark of the beast is a symbol that distinguishes those who worship the beast. Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 through 17. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. He causes all to receive a mark. A mark will be given to everyone under the government of the beast and his associate. This mark is necessary to participate in the economy and those without it will not be able to buy or sell anything. Only those bearing a special number on a visible part of their body, hand or forehead, will be allowed to trade and the number will only be marked on those who engage in imperial idolatry. Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. 666 is the one that captures attention. It is made up of sixes, a figure that always alludes to the inability of humans to achieve the seven that represents complete perfection. It is used here as a clue to the identity of the last world dictator before Jesus reigns for a thousand years. The term mark has no special biblical usage apart from its association with the beast. The Greek term charagma was most commonly used for imprints or documents or coins. Charagma is well attested to have been an imperial seal of the Roman Empire used on official documents during the first and second centuries. In addition to its use in Revelation, the term charagma appears only once in the New Testament, specifically in Acts chapter 17, verse 29, where it refers to an artistic image. Taking this mark is like turning your back on God. It shows you're choosing to side with those against God, it's not just a mark you can see on your body. It really means you're living your life against what God wants. The Seal of God versus Mark of the Beast. The Seal of God and the Mark of the Beast are two opposing marks. The Seal of God represents divine authority and protection and is often associated with spiritual marks that denote faith and obedience to God. On the other hand, the mark of the beast signifies submission to worldly, corrupt power and is often interpreted as a physical or visible sign of compliance with evil forces. These symbols have been used to signify the struggle between good and evil and the importance of choosing the right path in life. Number 7. The New Heaven The heavenly city, the New Jerusalem, also known as the Tabernacle of God, Holy City, City of God, Celestial City, City Foursquare, and Heavenly Jerusalem is a heavenly paradise on earth. The Bible mentions it in various passages, such as Galatians chapter 4, verse 26, and Hebrews 11, 12, and 13. However, it is mostly extensively described in Revelation 21. There is an end to recorded history in Revelation 21. All of the ages have come and gone. The tribulation has passed. The battle of Armageddon has been fought and won by our Lord Jesus Christ. Satan has been chained for the 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth. A new glorious temple has been established in Jerusalem. The final rebellion against God has been quashed and Satan has received his just punishment and eternity in the lake of fire. The great white throne judgment has taken place and mankind has been judged. New Jerusalem is a city that is in heaven. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 2. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. We see in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2 that this holy city was made ready, and it came down out of heaven from God 
And the phrase, made ready, implies that the New Jerusalem has already been completed by this time. John does not say that he saw the New Jerusalem created. He claims to have seen the New Jerusalem emerge from the heavens. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12 calls it again, All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. The idea of a new earth with a new atmosphere and sky is a familiar theme in the scriptures. Many of the prophets, both Old and New Testaments, spoke of this new heaven and new earth. Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 18. Look, I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Be glad, rejoice forever in my creation. And look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. The city is set apart by its holiness and newness, making it unique from any other earthly city. The name Jerusalem gives its continuity with earth, especially with the place of our redemption. Throughout history, humans have never experienced a community that is entirely free from sin. Adam and Eve only knew a limited community, and community in a larger context only came long after the fall. In the New Jerusalem, we have a complete unique community one that is sinless, pure, and righteous. It is a holy city. Problems arise when believers accept this kind of community now. The city cannot be attributed to human achievement, but rather is a gift from God. Revelation chapter 21, verses three through four. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. John overhears a proclamation from heaven that the tabernacle of God is with men and that he will dwell among them. Because they are God's chosen people, they will have a level of closeness with him that they could never have dreamed possible. God will be present with them. The tabernacle that Moses built was meant to depict the dwelling place of God here on earth was past the representation of the dwelling place of God. This tabernacle of God is the reality of his presence. He will set up residence among them, and they will serve as his people. This beautifully condenses the core of both God's desire and man's purpose. Simply said, God's objective is to live in close fellowship with man, and man's purpose is to be a people unto God. Revelation chapter 21, verses 5 through 8. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. They are accurate, incorruptible, and trustworthy. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the one who thirsts, I will give water from the fountain of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes the world by adhering faithfully to Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowards and unbelieving and abominable who are devoid of character and personal integrity and practice or tolerate immorality and murderers and sorcerers with intoxicating drugs and idolaters and occultists who practice and teach false religions and all the liars who knowingly deceive and twist truth, their part will be in the lake that blazes with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. We read, all things new. At this point in his plan of the ages, the plan is complete. All things are new. 
Our instinct is to romantically consider innocence as man's perfect state and wish Adam would have never done what he did, but we fail to realize that redeemed man is greater than innocent man, that we gain more in Jesus than we ever lost in Adam. God's perfect state is one of redemption. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 15 through 16, the angel who talked to me held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. When he measured it, he found it was a square, as wide as it was long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. One of the reasons that many people try to spiritualize and dismiss this city is because of its enormous size. It is a city that goes above and beyond what you can imagine. Now, if you work that out, to give you an idea that each one of the walls and the cube of it, they're all 1,400 miles, between 1,400 and 1,500 miles, and the ground floor square mile is 2,250,000 square miles on the first level. Did you ever hear it said like that? London covers an area of 140 square miles. The city four square is 2,250,000 square miles on the first floor. This city is 20 times as big as all of New Zealand. It's 10 times as big as Germany. It's 10 times as big as France. It's 40 times as big as all of England. It is ever so much bigger than India. We read, She had a great and high wall. The wall was not needed for defense because there were no more enemies. But the great and high wall gave the city definition and shows that some will be excluded from the city. Only the righteous can enter. Are there really streets of gold in heaven? Is it true that there are streets of gold in heaven? Look down at verse 18. Then again at verse 21 of chapter 21. And the construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. And notice verse 21. Twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. I can't imagine it. Once again, can you imagine seeing the city as you approach it? When the Bible says that this city reflects light, it is not from any material combustion. It is not from any consumption of fuel. The light of the world comes from the Lamb Himself, and He will be the light of the city at that time. No wonder Paul described our future in this way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, he says, That is what the Scriptures mean when they say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. In the city are the tree of life for the healing of the nations and the river of life. The New Jerusalem is the ultimate fulfillment of all God's promises. The New Jerusalem is God's goodness made fully manifest. The tree of life is first portrayed in chapter 2, verse 9 of the book of Genesis as being in the midst of the Garden of Eden with another divine tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life was planted by God. As a result of his disobedience, Adam lost his eternal life. The tree of life in Eden must have had some role to play in maintaining the life of Adam and Eve. The Bible opens with a description of a tree of life. Now we see the tree of life again. It's a little difficult to picture this picturesque scenery in our minds. It's possible that when John talks about a large street, he's referring to one that has a river running down the middle of it and that there's a large tree or series of trees that grow with their roots on either side of the river. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your guidance and your protection. As time ticks forward, we pray for the understanding of these prophecies. We pray for forgiveness of our sins, both knowingly and unknowingly. We pray that you guide us from now till eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. However, before all this was creation, and before creation was Jesus, where was Jesus before creation? To watch 